We've all had our share of bad days, haven't we? You know, you, uh, your car breaks down or your vacation gets canceled or worse, you get a difficult diagnosis from the doctor. I don't think much could top this guy's day. He was, here's this guy sitting in a bar, staring at his drink, just sitting there transfixed for like an hour. And all of a sudden, this big troublemaking truck driver comes in and grabs his drink from in front of him and slugs it down and starts laughing. And well, the guy burst into tears and it kind of freaked out the truck driver. He wasn't expecting that. So, hey, oh, come on, man. I was just joking, you know. I'll buy you another drink. I can't stand to see a grown man cry. And he says, no, it's, it's not that. I, I, today is the worst day of my life. First, I overslept and missed a very important meeting and my furious boss fires me. When I leave the office, I find out my car has been stolen. The police say they can't do anything about it. And so I take a cab home, and after he takes off, I realize I left my wallet in the back seat of the cab, and thinking it can't get any worse than that, I go and open up the door, and my wife hands me divorce papers and tells me to get out. So on the way here, I stop at a chemical company and buy some stuff, and i am just been sitting here thinking about ending it all, and you come in and drink all my poison. <laughs> I guess it's a bad day for both of them, right? <laughs> Folks, you know, the Bible never promises us that our lives are going to be free from, from pain and, and difficulties. And it never has said or never will say that life is going to be a bowl of cherries for us. In fact, it actually promises us that we will have trials and tribulations in this life. But the secret to a successful life is knowing where to turn when those things hit. When the, when the trial, when the tribulation comes, uh, the testings and all of those things. That's a lesson we're going to learn tonight from a leper, a guy who has leprosy. So let's begin reading there in Luke chapter 17. We'll start in verse 11. It says, Now it happened as he, Jesus, went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then he entered a certain village, and there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And so it was, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten lepers, were there, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, arise, go your way, your faith has made you well. Father, we're just Thankful for these incredible stories in the scriptures of your power, of your compassion, and of our faults and failings as human beings as we encounter you and, and, and what you can do for us and, and the different ways of responding to that. We prayed it tonight. We might learn something about ourselves even uh, in, in all of these lessons that we'll be looking at tonight, Lord, we're just asking for you, your Holy Spirit, to guide us, to uh, direct us through it, and, and just to, to bless, Lord. I pray that the folks that have been drawn here by your Spirit would receive at least a few nuggets, Lord, that they can take and, and chew on for the week and, and, and let them help them walk, get through this, uh, this, this walk this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, as you work your way through all the Gospels, but even especially the Gospel of Luke, you see him doing, uh, Jesus doing lots of miracles and sharing parables all the time. And if you are a student of the Word, here's a little, uh, little nugget for you here. Always take time to pause and look a little bit below the surface there of the Scriptures, because there's usually a miracle hidden in every parable and a parable to be found in every miracle. And on the surface here, we see Jesus, you know, healing 10 men of leprosy, and then only one coming back to thank him. 
But, and I know Thanksgiving is coming, and that's a good reason to have this message tonight, but thankfulness isn't the only lesson that we're going to be gleaning from this uh, miraculous healing. There's several, several spiritual principles, valuable spiritual principles that are just kind of laying beneath the surface there, and I hope to dig them up for you. Let's look at, I would think, about seven or more uh, lessons from a leper tonight that we can learn maybe even about ourselves. First of all, you, I, have a deadly problem that only Jesus can fix. I love the way that kids hear uh, things. You know, one little boy hearing this story in the Bible thought the preacher was saying leopards. And so for the longest time, he, he thought he was talking, he thought Jesus was dealing with, you know, these big jungle cats. And so truly it matters how a preacher, you know, pronounce their words. And so there was an old country preacher who pronounced it as leapers. And so the whole congregation had this idea of a bunch of men, you know, that were just jumping around. And uh, funny how the mind works here, but there's, you know, there's nothing funny about leprosy. In uh, Bible times, it was a very horrific uh, problem to have. The, the word was often used, leper was often used to describe a variety of skin diseases, but doctors today believe that it is what is now what we call Hansen's disease, that what most people had then. It starts with a, you know, a little white patch uh, of skin there that becomes numb and so numb that the victims can't even feel a needle being uh, you know, poked into that that patch of, of white, dry uh, skin there, the patch begins to then spread over the body, and all, often it manifests itself on the face. And so the disease is impossible, you know, to hide. And then it begins to form these little spongy tumors there on the face and other places. And at the same time, it's also attacking the internal organs as well. And the nerve endings, they become numb to the point that the victim can't tell, you know, when something's hurting, like in the fire or, or slamming it in a door or whatever the case may be. The leprosy itself wasn't always fatal, but the majority of lepers died from the diseases that they contracted because of their weakened condition. Lepers were called the walking dead. They were kicked out of their homes. They were ostracized from their villages. They were forced to live in colonies together. And uh, they weren't allowed even to go to the temple to worship God. Now, although none of us in here, I don't, wouldn't think, have leprosy, it's, it's a good description of us, though. We're all born with, again, that deadly disease that the Bible calls sin. And it's always terminal. It causes us to be spiritual outcasts. It's part of our genetic code. I got it from my parents, they got it from their parents, and they got it from their parents, and all the way back to, you know, Grandpa Adam and, and Grandma Eve. That's where we got it. It came from them. And the Bible says there in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 6, says, ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, Children given to corruption, they have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Those words were written 2,000, some 700 years ago, but God could say, I think, the same exact thing about our culture today and how rotten it is. The Old Testament prophets, they taught that God holds both individuals and nations accountable for their sin and their immorality. And gang, we've got, we've got Bible scholars spending tons of time trying to figure out Bible codes and, uh, you know, what is the meaning of 666 and uh, all the different... Uh, way that they can masticate their way through the world. I remember I, had a, I lived next to a, a prophecy buff, and he just didn't get it. He would talk out of this side of his mouth all about God and prophecy, and then he would talk out of this side, and he'd be you know, using curse words about certain uh, you know, people groups in America, and, and it just was you know, kind of a thing. You know what? The whole Bible, what is it about? It's about hearing God calling us to repent. He came to save 
to seek and save the lost, didn't he? We're living in a sin-sick, a very, very sick, sick world because this deadly disease of sin. Maybe you're feeling kind of healthy tonight. You're feeling okay, but listen, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, and I would expect the majority of you in here would on a Wednesday night, but I don't know all of you. I see some faces I don't know. Uh, there's this little nasty cancer, and it's invisible, and it's inside your soul. My wife, when she was uh, uh, back in 2001, I believe it was, but all her life, she, uh, she, well, she had a malignant tumor growing in her L5 vertebrae for the majority of her life, and as she went to doctor after chiropractor after quack after specialist trying to figure out why she was having so much low back pain, they all took x-rays, but they never found anything, nothing that they could say is the, you know, they could pinpoint as the problem because there was this tumor, but it was hidden inside her L5 vertebrae. In the same way, you have a sickness. If you don't know the Lord tonight, that can't be detected by the most modern of medical, you know, diagnostic tools, but God's word says it's there. And what are you going to do about it? Well, we need to do what these 10 men did about it. And maybe you have another problem, not salvation as, as a problem, but maybe you're, maybe you're living on the edge over here and, and, and need to do some repenting. But God says that you need to, just like this leper, admit your need and cry out to Jesus. That's the second lesson here from these lepers. The 10 guys, they got together, decided that they weren't just going to you know, give up and die. So they got up, headed towards Jesus. Now, when they found him, you know, it wasn't like they sat around and made small talk. You know, hey, hi, did you see the chariot races last week? Or, ah, how about this weather we're having? No, no. They cried out as one voice, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And then just think about it. It might have been easy for these 10 lepers to look at each other and think, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're not that bad. We're all in the same condition here. And, you know, some of us are maybe a little you know, worse than the other. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot better than that guy over there in the, in the colony. But they didn't. They said, hey, guys, we've got a big problem. We're, we, we've got this issue, and we need help fast or we're going to die. And too many people today are living in denial. They don't want to admit their need because they look around and just like, you know, other people, they can find somebody worse than they are. And you can, in America, of course you can do that. It's pretty easy. But, I mean, we live in a spiritual leper colony called America here. But there's plenty of chances to think, you know, I'm not so bad. I've never robbed a bank. I've never... You know, I've never molested a child. I've never murdered anybody. I've never pushed drugs or any of that. In fact, I'm probably a lot better than a lot of those hypocrites at Calvary Chapel, Merritt Island. And uh, listen, before Jesus can help you, friend, you got to quit fooling yourself and admit that you have a problem. Uh, And that's not all either. You still have to also cry out to Jesus. You guys, I mean... All the step programs you can look at, they all have that first step, isn't it? It's admit that you got a problem and that you can't help yourself or whatever it is. I'm addicted to this. I'm, I'm I, you know, trapped in this or I'm whatever. I'm not a biggie on, uh, on the 12-steppers, but uh, it's not enough just to admit you have a problem. You also have to then seek help. But before you can have a relationship with Jesus, you've got to say, I'm a, I'm a rotten sinner. Have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. Read about a woman who was at a hospital, got a diagnosis she didn't, didn't, didn't care to hear about, got a bad report, and she was so mad at God that she went to that hospital chapel to have a little chat with him to tell him off. And so she was so ticked because she figured that God had been fooling people by telling them that he loved them, but he wasn't healing them and that he was a God of love. Well, she made it to the chapel, storming down the aisle there, and when she, all of a sudden, she tripped right near the, the front of the, of the chapel there, and, and at the bottom step of the altar, she looks up, and it says on a plaque on that bottom step, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And right then, God broke her heart, and she realized she didn't have any right to be blaming God, and so 
she should be asking for mercy instead and did, and, and God healed her. Have you ever have you done that? Are you doing that? Are you making demands of God? Or have you come to a place of, of total surrender where you've said, God, God, like, be merciful to me, a sinner. The third lesson that we're going to learn from a leper is this. God's power is not released until you step out. Sometimes he does heal instantaneous without any obedience to his word whatsoever, but more often than not, there's a, there's a step of faith that needs to be taken. There's, a, there's a, a, you know, a, a having faith that needs to be had. Here we see Jesus. Here was, he's on his way to Jerusalem. It's the last days of his ministry. He's, he's going to go there to die on a cross to redeem mankind. And yet, what's he do? He takes time out of his trip to go. I mean, he, it says his face was like a flint, but it wasn't because he stopped to heal these 10 guys. But here's the thing. God's busy right now holding the whole universe together. But you know what? He's got time for you. He'll take time for you. He hears us. He has time, and he'll hear your cry for help. Instead of laying hands on these guys, Jesus said, you know, go show yourselves to the priest. Leviticus 13 has a lot of incredibly detailed regulations about how the Jewish priest would, uh, could declare a person clean or unclean. Uh, well, these guys knew they were unclean already, and they'd already been declared lepers. And right here, G- Jesus is bringing them to uh, uh, what I would call a crisis of faith. Because they could have said, uh, what do you mean go to the priest? Why don't, can't you just touch us or spit on us or you know, do something to make us well? I saw you heal, you know, Jehoiakim down the road there last week. He, he got healed, and, you know, David over there, he got healed, and you didn't make them go to the priest. You just healed the leper there. Uh, or they could have said, hey, you know, excuse me, uh, go to the priest. We're not healed yet. What do you mean go to the priest? I'm not healed yet. I can't go to the priest. He's going to tell me I'm still a leper. I just got checked last week. I'm still the same shape. And so it says that, Instead, it says that all ten of them headed off to see the priests. And note that it says, as they went, they were cleansed. There's a powerful lesson about faith here. You see, it wasn't until they stepped out in faith and obedience to Jesus that they experienced the healing power. Jesus gave them the word. He said, go show yourself to the priest. They stepped out in faith. They headed towards the priests, and boom, they were healed. And that's when it happened. They didn't stand there and say, well, you know, after you heal me, I'll go see the priest and let him declare me, un- I mean, let him declare me clean. But that's the way faith works. Faith is trusting and obeying God, even if you don't have any visible or physical evidence supporting your decision. I, I love the story over in Matthew 14 about the disciples out on the boat, In the storm, you know the story, we've told it a million times, I know we have, but here it is, Jesus coming on the water to them, they're freaking out, they're thinking he's a ghost, and you have to give them that one, because up to that point, you know, in history, walking on the water thing hadn't quite been mastered, they had, you know, never seen it before, so they see somebody walking on the water, they freaked out, Uh, but Jesus tells them, don't be afraid, and Simon Peter, who's always finding a way to make a fool of himself, said, Lord... If it's really you, tell me to come out on the water to you, you know? And Jesus says, come. And now here's a picture of faith, isn't it? Peter throws his leg over the side of the boat, and he starts walking to Jesus. And you might think Peter was walking on water, but actually he wasn't. He was walking on the Word of God. Jesus told him to come. The Word of God Peter's walking on the word of God. He's obeying, and and he's walking on the words of God. If Jesus had told him, you know, if he hadn't told him to step out onto the water, and Peter stepped out, he'd have sunk like a rock, wouldn't he? Because God hadn't told him he could come out on the water. But when, you know, the whole story, Peter takes his eyes off of Jesus at the wind and the waves, and he probably started thinking to himself, this is, what am I doing? (laughs) This is impossible. You can't walk on water. What what am I thinking here? No way. And so he takes his eyes off Jesus, and he began to doubt. And then he began to sink. And what happened? Jesus grabs him, 
What did he say to him? Oh, you of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? I was right here. I told you to come. You started walking on it. Why did you doubt? Faith is walking on the promises of God, the word of God. Faith doesn't need any evidence. It simply obeys. This book is full of God's directions on how we're to live. But with every single directive, he also provides the power to accomplish it, doesn't he? Our job is to simply step out in faith and obey him. And here's a great quote about faith. Faith is coming to the edge of all you can see and feel and taking one more step into the darkness, trusting God will either catch you or he'll teach you to fly. (laughs) I like that one. What's God telling you to, to do in his word today? What's God telling you to do? What are you waiting for? Step out in faith and obey him. And if you do, I promise, well, God promises you that he will also, you will experience his mighty power as you step out. That's the lesson from the leper. Here's the fourth one. It's good to spend time at the feet of Jesus. That's the fourth lesson we learned from this guy. On the way to the priest here, these guys look at each other and they said, hey, you know, whatever, Daniel, your, your skin's getting clean, man. Your, your face looks better. And hey, you know, uh, my hand, there's life, there's color back in it here. And all they began to examine themselves and they realized that they were healed. I mean, can't you just picture them hugging each other and jumping up and down? I guess you could say they were 10 lepers leaping. I'm sorry, (laughs) Christmas is coming, the goose is getting fat. Now at this point, we're not sure what the other 90% of the guys of the group, uh, you know, what happened to them. Maybe Maybe they did go to the priests and show themselves, just like Jesus told them to, or maybe they ran back to their families and, you know, hey, I'm healed, you know, we don't know. One of them could have said, you know, I just want to see if this really lasts. You know, I mean, I know I look healed, but another one, I knew I was getting better anyway. You know, I always said it was good diet and exercise, and, you know, that, or what do we know? What we do know from Jesus' response is that only one of them did the right thing. He wasn't just content to go to church and see the priest. He, he turned and he ran back to Jesus and he fell at his feet to give him thanks. He wanted a relationship, not just religion. Falling at somebody's feet, that's that's a picture of submission, isn't it? Falling at some Mary, she spent a lot of time at Jesus' feet when he would come over for dinners there at their house. The woman at Simon's house spent time at the feet of Jesus, washing his feet with her tears. And in the book of Revelation, it tells us that the 24... uh, Elders who represent all the redeemed of all the ages are going to be bowing before the Lamb who is on the throne. Folks, it's a good thing to spend time at the feet of Jesus. And here's the key key to this lesson here. These ten men, all of them, were exposed to God's power, but only one actually sought a personal relationship with him. 90% of these men were happy to get the blessing of God, but only one of them cared enough to come back and worship the healer. And man, I think that's true of today, isn't it? I mean, God's blessings are poured out on folks all over this entire world, not just on his children. The word says that he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust, but only a relatively, you know, few are interested in having a personal relationship with God. How about yourself? What's your relationship with it? Have you found that you maybe you only come to God with your shopping list? Or maybe you come to God, you know, and, and you use him like a heavenly 911 call, you know, hey God, emergency here, bail me, please. He don't want to just be your 911 operator. He wants to be your friend, and he cleared the way for you to know him intimately. He blazed that trail all the way to the throne of God for us, and he loves your company. 
And you may have sins tonight. They don't need to keep you from him. And that's what sin does. It keeps you from fellowshipping with God, doesn't it? Well, he's dealt with them on the cross. Confess them, fall down at his feet. You know, the one who loves you and wants and loves spending time with you. Make time to fall at the feet of Jesus and worship him. I promise you, you will never, ever feel better. The fifth lesson that we learn from the leper here is feeling thankful is different from giving thanks. This guy threw himself at Jesus' feet and he thanked him. Of course, the most amazing thing about this miracle is that ten were healed, one came back to say thank you. Even Jesus was astonished at that. He said in verse 17, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? He made a big point of it. Now check out his next words very carefully because he's actually identifying himself as God here. He asked, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And when the man came and fell at his feet to say thank you, Jesus said it was giving praise to God. Tell that to the next JW that shows up at your door and tell him to put that in his pipe and smoke it. So... uh, He's God, and there's all over the Word tells us that. Back to the point, though. Don't you know that God uh, is still saddened with how relatively few people actually express thanksgiving to him? I think think a lot of Americans, they've just gotten so busy, too busy to stop and acknowledge God and just simply say, thank you, Lord, thank you. Perhaps they've they've convinced themselves, you know, that they deserve everything they've got, so they don't thank God. I've never seen an episode, uh, not one second of The Simpsons show, but I heard in this one episode the family was sitting down for a meal, and the dad tells the boy, Bart, to give thanks before the meal, and he says, Dear God, we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. I don't know how people could laugh at that. I don't know how that, you know, it reveals a problem that we, you know, that a lot of folks have. They, they live their lives enjoying the blessings of God, never once stopping to say thanks. And they're like that old pig that's rooting around, eating acorns, never once looking up at the tree that provided them. In the Bible, it says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says that. People ask all the time, ask preachers all the time, you know, how do I find God's will for my life? Well, good place is to start reading in his word. And this verse says very clearly and plainly that God's will for your life is for you to give thanks in everything. If you aren't obeying that portion of his will for your life, where that's very clearly uh, you know, spelled out for you, then what makes you think he's going to reveal even more of that, of his will to you? Obey what you know. Now you know something tonight and you've got to obey it. Then you'll get more. Again, the key thing here is to give thanks, not just to feel thankful. No doubt the other nine were you know, thankful about being cleansed. How could you not feel thankful after being healed of a deadly disease? But only one of them of the ten did the right thing by coming to Jesus and expressing his thanksgiving. There's a huge difference between simply feeling grateful and actually expressing, you know, gratitude. Say Joe in the booth back there does something nice for me, like buying a Miami Dolphins t-shirt or something, you know, for Pastor Appreciation Month, although it's already passed. It's October, now it's November, but you know, if he gives me something like that, I look at him, I think to myself, wow, that sure was nice. You know, I'm thinking it to myself, but I don't say it to him, I just think it, he'd probably get his feelings hurt, you know, and I'd miss a chance to to be a blessing to him as well. But ah, here's the thing, if I write him a thank you, I'm sorry, we don't, men don't write thank yous. If I went up to him and said, hey, thanks, man, that's really cool then I'd be able to bless him back and he, you know, that kind of a thing. He'd get blessed too. But, you know, with God, don't just feel thankful. Give thanks. The Bible says in Hebrews 13, verse 15, 
Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It says the fruit of our lips, not a warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart. Don't just feel it. Voice it. Say it. Tell him. Tell the Lord how thankful you are. But again, you aren't just to thank God for the good things in life, are we? What did that say over in 1 Thessalonians 5.18? We're to give thanks in what? Everything. Whatever happens, you can always find something to give thanks about it in. Matthew Henry, I know Malcolm's probably used this one before. I think I heard him a while back. But he was an early American preacher. Great one. Every pastor has his commentaries of the Bible on their shelf. Most people wouldn't think, you know, that a circumstance would, like he's you know, going to be in, he'd be able to give thanks. But he did. After he got robbed, he said, uh, I'm thankful that during these years I've never been robbed before. Also, even though they took my money, they did not take my life. Although they took all I had, it was not much. And finally, I'm grateful that it was I who was robbed and not I who robbed. Try that sometime. Going through a a stretch, a patch of pain and difficulty, find at least five things to be thankful for and tell the Lord about it. You know, I wonder, as I read about the healing of the ten lepers there, I wondered if the Lord isn't trying to tell us that maybe there's about 90% of us that know him that don't thank him enough. What do you think of that? I, that's, I know that's reading into it, but I don't want to be that. I've seen unthankful kids, and, you know, it's not a pleasant sight. And everything, give thanks. Determine that you're going to be a thankful person like the one leper was. The sixth lesson, we're getting close to the end here, <clears throat> is that a relationship with Jesus makes you a foreigner in this world. Jesus pointed out that the one man who returned was a Samaritan, a foreigner. He acted differently than the other 90% of the other lepers. In fact, uh, in that, I think we can find a powerful lesson for us. If you're in Christ, if you have a relationship with Jesus, then you don't act and think like most other people do. We are always in the minority in the way that we act and think. We go against the flow We never quite feel at home in this world, and rightfully so. The Bible says that our citizenship is where? In heaven. Amen. In heaven. And we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. doesn't matter where you come from. What matters is your destination. That's most important. Amen. Although we are citizens of Florida and of America, our main citizenship is in heaven. That's why we often feel like foreigners. We feel out of place. Uh, Those times that I've been away from my family on missions trips, I always feel that that tug for home, you know, and I realize that I'm only in this land for a short time, but I'll soon be returning home. And that's the same way that we need to feel about heaven. This world is not my permanent home. And I am homesick for heaven. How about you? I am homesick for heaven. Peter writes, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims or aliens and strangers, as the NIV says it, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. But this guy, this this leper was different from all the other ones in the crowd of of lepers. Are you, or do you, do you, do you look like everybody else at work? Do you act like the rest of the guys? Do you gossip like the rest of the folks you hang with? Do you, all, do you watch, you know, the garbage TV like the rest of them watch? Or if I was to be able to make myself invisible and follow you around for the week, would I find ample evidence that you are different from the rest? Lastly, Jesus says, or it, the last lesson that we learn is that uh, to let Jesus finish what he started. Let him finish what he started in you. Look again there at Jesus' words to this man in verse 19. He said, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. Concentrate on that last word. That is the word sozo, which means saved. It's the same word that the Philippian jailer used when he said, you know, what must I do to be saved? And the word means to be made complete or whole. Um, Jesus didn't just come to this earth to heal people. 
of diseases. Otherwise, he would have probably started a string of, of hospitals, you know. No, we're told that his word says he came to seek and save the lost. He came to make people whole, didn't he? Here's the result of this miracle. Ten men were cleansed. Only one man became whole. 99% of them only received a small portion of what could have been theirs. And only one received the full salvation. Folks, Jesus wants to do way more than just, you know, clean you up. He wants to make you whole. He wants to make you complete. One of my favorite, favorite promises in the entire Bible is in Philippians 1.6. He who began, has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a lifelong process though, isn't it? Are you like the nine? Maybe you've just simply approached Jesus because, you know, you wanted your eternal fire insurance and, and now you're just kind of, you know, hanging out. Or are you coming to him daily at his feet, thankfully worshiping him so he can make you whole? I don't know why you came to church tonight, but I know why Jesus came here tonight. He wants to make you whole. He wants to make me whole. Are you whole? One of my favorite movies, and I'm closing with this, is Ben-Hur. So many scenes in there, they just, you know, they choke you up. Like when Ernest Borgnine is cracking the whip and Jesus comes over and gives Ben-Hur the cup of water and, and Ernie's, you know, he's a Roman soldier and he's, a, he's got the, the, the whip up and he looks in Jesus' eyes and he just, the hand goes down, you know, and he's just staring at him. Oh my gosh, breaks me up every time I see it. But uh, another great moment in that movie is, is you know, after the buildup of Ben-Hur's mom and sister having leprosy to watch him get, uh, watch them get healed, you know, as the Lord walks by on his way to Calvary carrying his cross, their lives changed instantly. Man, that makes the toughest guy in the room cry like a baby. And not just because it's a feel-good scene, but because it makes me think again how the Lord did that with me. I was good as dead. I was a dead man walking, but Jesus touched me and gave me hope. Not only cleansed me of my sin, but he's making me whole. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like those other nine. I want to be the one that says, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for what you have done. And that's all, you know, I went and saw the passion of Christ for the first time, and I just sat there with tears. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's all I could say. Let's all stand. I've got a song to sing. You're going to sing it with me. It's an oldie. Can you put it up? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free.